So over the past few months, our online events have been broadcast from Belgium, Norway, Spain, and finally today, Belfast, Northern Ireland. On behalf of myself and Professor Karen Winter from Queen's University, Belfast, I'm delighted to welcome you all here this afternoon. I hope you'll enjoy the programme that we've put together for you. And we particularly want to welcome our colleagues from across Europe who are joining us today. It's disappointing that we can't host you all in person and give you a tour of this small but mighty place that we call home. So instead, I'll share with you some interesting facts about Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland's the smallest country in the United Kingdom, and it makes up part of the UK along with England, Scotland and Wales, but is situated on an island in Western Europe called Ireland. In 1921, the island of Ireland was divided into two parts. Northern Ireland remained part of the United Kingdom and the rest became known as the Republic of Ireland. Whilst we're part of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland makes its own laws. The parliament buildings of the Northern Irish government in Belfast are called Stormont. Sometimes you might hear Northern Ireland being referred to as Ulster, and that's the ancient name of that part of Ireland. Although English is the most popular language here, Chinese is the most widely spoken minority language. Some of you might have heard of the Giant's Causeway, a famous rocky area of the coast in County Antrim. It's made up of thousands of hexagonal blocks of rock formed by ancient volcanic eruptions. Our population is only about 1.8 million. And despite our small geographical size, Northern Ireland is a culture, country of culture, producing famous writers like Seamus Heaney and C.S. Lewis, as well as noted actors like Liam Neeson, James Nesbitt and Kenneth Branagh. As I said, we're small, but we're mighty. And so to the programme for this afternoon, we have a range of presentations today that set out the policy and legislative context for our work with children under 12, and we'll also hear some lovely examples from practice. Karen will give an overview of the PANDA project, and then we will hear from Northern Ireland's Commissioner for Children and Young People, Kula Yasuma. Kula took up her appointment in March 2015, and as Commissioner, her role is to safeguard and promote the rights and best interests of children and young people. The Commissioner uses the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child to guide her work and the work of her team. All the Commissioner's work is focused on making sure children and young people have access to these rights in their day-to-day -day lives so that they have the best opportunity to reach their full potential. We will then have a video presentation from Eilish McDaniel, the Director of Family and Children's Policy at our Department of Health. The department is the lead government department for the policy and strategy for personal health and for social services in Northern Ireland. That is all professional aspects on how social care is delivered in Northern Ireland, including the social work strategy, child protection and early authoritative interventions. After a short break, we'll hear some examples from practice. Karen will talk with Theresa McAllister from the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland. The Safeguarding Board was established in 2012 and its objective is to safeguard and promote the welfare of children and young people in Northern Ireland by coordinating the work and ensuring the effectiveness of each person or body represented on the board. The board is made up of key partner organisations from the statutory community and voluntary sectors. We'll then hear from Jenny and Nicola from my own organisation, The Voice of Young People in Care. They'll outline how we engage with young children to seek their views, wishes and feelings about their life and care. And then we'll hear from the Head of Service for Specialist Residential Care, Mary Louise Sloan. Mary Louise will outline some great work by her and her team and how they designed a framework, especially for the work with young children and in partnership with children and young people. 
Finally, Karen will sum up this afternoon's key things before we open up for a final set of questions and answers before we close. Each of you will receive an evaluation form by email after the event, and we really would appreciate it if you would complete it and return that to us. As I said, we have the use of the chat facility, so if you have any questions or comments or any difficulties, please enter them in the chat. So lastly, finally for me, all I have to say is enjoy the session. And now I'm going to hand you over to Professor Karen Winter. Hi, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to our learning event this afternoon. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about the background to the Panda project. But first, a tiny bit about me. You can see I've got my camera on. I'm actually sitting in my kitchen at home because of the pandemic. Normally I would be in my office. Um, I'm a social worker by background, having lived in Northern Ireland since 1994. Um, I spent several years working as a social worker and a team manager. And then I was a guardian with the Guardian Ad Litem Agency. And I note that there are colleagues here from the agency today, so a very warm welcome to you too. So a little bit about our project. Our project, PANDA, is an acronym um, and forms around the words participation and collaboration in action. Our focus is on the participation rights of children who are 12 years and under. The reason for the focus has come about over a period of time. From our professional practice and from our academic work, we realise that there has been enormous progress with the participation rights of children and young people. However, we're also acutely aware that the participation rights of children aged 12 and under causes challenges for professionals across Europe there remain many barriers um, to their full implementation. With that in mind, and using the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the UNCRC as our foundation blocks, we as educators and professionals have come together to help address this gap by working with professionals to formulate uh, new tools, methods and frameworks for our work with young children. Next slide, please, Lee. So who is involved in this project? There are eight partners, four universities Belgi in Belgium, Norway, Northern Ireland and Spain. And there are four partners who are NGOs and other organisations working closely with children and young people in the partner countries. You can see there a website link to the project if you want to gather more information. Our objectives are fourfold. First of all, we want to try and help increase the competence of social workers and professionals working with young children. Secondly, we want to help create the conditions for participatory social work with young children. Thirdly, we want to implement a participatory approach. And fourthly, we want to provide trainers with tools and methods to stimulate participation. These objectives might seem um, rather big, <laughs> uh, but we're very hopeful in our collaboration together that we can make a difference in this area. We know from our work to date that there is a very keen interest to enable young children to share their views, their experiences and their feelings. And there is also an enormous commitment to making sure that those experiences, feelings and perspectives are center in all of the meetings that children have regarding their own lives. Um, and so we're very hopeful that, that we can make a big difference in terms of practice. Next slide, Lee, please. In terms of the things that we think will help, um, we're going to create a, a media library which pulls together existing policies and practices in this area. And it will contain podcasts, Vimeos, reports and reflections that explain specific methods and tools. 
Our second um, output will be a policy and management framework, which will guide managers and professionals regarding their work with young children. And the third thing, as I've already mentioned, is a toolkit for trainers. What we would really like to see is that training is uh, better implemented in social work degree programmes, but also in continuous professional development within organisations. Ultimately, the thing that we're really interested in um, and committed to is ensuring that our young children who have very valid experiences, perspectives and feelings are enabled to have their voice heard and that this voice is put at the centre of all of the decisions that are made about them. We know from our practice that sometimes the voice is there, but it's not really heard, it's not really elevated. And our aim is that young children's voice is on the same platform and the same level as every other person who makes a contribution to young children's lives. Um, so that gives you a really brief overview of the project. We're very excited about it and we really hope that you enjoy the learning event today. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand back to Alicia. Thanks, Karen. So our first uh, input of this afternoon's webinar is from our Northern Ireland's Commissioner for Children and Young People, Kula Yusuma. And Kula is going to talk to you today about her views on the progress that we have made with children's participative rights, but also what else needs to be done. That's good. Oh, thanks for telling me what I was going to talk about. I'm going to now quickly change what I was going to say, Alicia. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to, to the Panda Project for the invitation. So really, um, the more I read about it and also listening to Karen speak there, it's, it's really very, very exciting and actually very, very important. So I am delighted to be here uh, to open uh, this um, afternoon event and, and, and welcome you all to Northern Ireland. And I'm really sorry that you're, you're not seeing it for real and sitting there eating uh, uh, tato cheese and onion crisps with a glass of Guinness, but, but on another day. I also want to thank Alicia for actually in the invitation telling me exactly what I should say. So she's actually probably written most of my remarks today. So if you don't like it, take it up with her. Um, you, you've heard already what a Children's Commissioner does. And actually, those of you who are from Norway, Spain and Belgium, and also I understand that, that, that there's some colleagues from Italy, you all have commissioners or, or ombuds, ombudsmen for children so you have, and in some, and in well, and in play, and in Spain and Belgium, you have more than one, like we do here in the UK. So I work, um, I work uh, and, and cover Northern Ireland, but there are also colleague commissioners in England, Scotland, Wales, and there's an ombudsman for children in in, in the Republic of Ireland that Alicia's already talked to you about. And of course, we have all followed the lead taken by Norway who had the very, very first ever children's commissioner in the world. So when Norway started, the rest of us followed. So um, it's a little bit daunting to speak to, to, to people from Norway because I, I, I appreciate how you've been working on, on this area much longer than us. So I'm not going to say too much about what I do, just to talk a little bit about remit of, 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 of my office. So as with all, as we, uh, and in accordance with the UNCRC, we work with children up until the age of 18 accepting in two circumstances. If they have a disability or if they've been in the care of the state. So uh, in that case we go to 21. So, so we stay with children until 21 and there's a lot of discussion to be had whether that should extend further to 25 but that's again for an, another place. You've heard I'm required by law um, like many of us are to have due regard to the UNCLC and that's where I'm going to start today. Um, and this is, um, again, you all know that the CRC has four um, guiding principles, four core principles, so, uh, and they're the lens that we see all the other articles. And one of them is Article 12, which affirms and enshrines the child's right to be seen as fully fledged persons who have the right to express their views in all matters affecting them and requires that those views be heard 
and giving due weight in accordance with the child's age and maturity. It recognises the potential of children to enrich decision-making processes, share perspectives and to participate as, as, as citizens and actors of change. And I'm going to, that's really going to be the theme, obviously, of what I'm going to say, but uh, of the whole Panda project. And when you set that alongside all the articles of the convention, the other three uh, principles, uh, right to non-discrimination, the right to have your best interests taken into account, and, and, and then the right to life, and then the other ones that, that, that become relevant when a child is living in a family that needs state intervention. Recognition of the role of parents, the right to maintain a relationship with parents if it's when, when the child's living away from them, if it's in their best interest, freedom of expression, freedom of, of thought, belief and religion, freedom of association, I could go on, no inter interference with family life, protection from violence, the, the, the right, Article 21 is really important, the right of, of a child to have their voice heard in all a judicial and administrative um, proceedings, including adoption, and of course the right to be protected in Article 34 from exploitation or, or abuse. Here in Northern Ireland, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has continually expressed frustration that, in Northern, that we don't have formalised structures in which we embed the child's right to have a voice and to have a say. And um, what we do have, though, is a very strong legislative and policy framework um, that, that means that everything is, should be in place strategically to make it happen. We have our children order from 1995, which is the governing uh, piece of legislation that, that governs um, with, with some reviews and updates um, how children in care, children in need and children with child protection register are, are looked after. We have section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act, which came, which came out of our peace agree agreement, the Good Friday Agreement. Um, we, you will hear a lot of talk about Good Friday, but it's it was actually a really important document from the point of view of trying to enshrine and in, embed rights into the constitution of Northern Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement is essentially our constitution. And the act that, that, that um, brought it in has a section that says we have to undertake um, consultation on all policy matters, including with children who are younger. There is also moves uh, to include children in care as a protective group in, in, in this way. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we view children in care in a minute. We also have something called the Children's Services Corporation Act, which again enshrines children's rights, the need for also all, all um, organisations to cooperate with each other and to develop a strategy, which was in our case, the children's strategy, which was published last year. And again, has an outcome which says we must actively encourage and support children and young people to contribute to society and to, to ensure that they are part of the decision making and planning processes on the issues with, which affect them. So on the big stuff and on the little stuff. And that's really, really important. And, and as I just said, it is as a, as a result of the work of organisations like Vo Voipec coming together with a, a, a very receptive group of civil servants led by Eilish McDaniel, um, who you're gonna hear from in a minute, that, may, that means that the Northern Ireland government has identified young people in care as a group requiring particular attention and effort. And if the state is to live up to their responsibility of being a parent, then they must act as any parent, as any good parent should by putting their children first and involving them in all the decision-making. I don't know how many of you are parents, but it, the idea of the family, of the, of, of the dinner table and of having family meetings and of sitting down and chatting, it's the bit I hated because I would much prefer telling my kids what to do, but clearly it's much better decision-making if you are having those regular conversations with your children from when they are tiny. Um, and, and um, involving them in the everyday life of the family. And, that, and what we have to think about is how that translates when the state is the parent. And that's why the work of Panda is so important. And we know children of all ages are able to have their voice heard as long as we're able to listen to them. It's about us listening, not about, uh, about them speaking. As of last Monday in Northern Ireland, we have 3,557 children 
who were in the care of the state. And we've seen an increase of nearly 200 um, during the pandemic. You are gonna hear from Eilish um, about our, our new strategy for, for looked after children, a life deserved caring for children and young people. And in it, there's a statement about how it's critical that children and young people are included in the processes that are important in, uh, when they're looked after, when they're in the care of the state. And that includes uh, care planning, uh, looked after children with views, the development and implementation of, of, of education plans and learning plans. This, there is a statement in it that says, where age and maturity permits, the child or young person should be fully engaged in and central to each of these processes and every step should be taken to ensure that they understand what is being proposed for their short, medium and longer term. So there's a, a very clear policy intent in Northern Ireland that we will hear the voices, we will involve children who are in the care of the state. But there's a mindset issue that we have to address. And this term where age and maturity permits worries me. I don't think it's meant to worry me, but it's worrying because that is your get out clause. That is your excuse not to do it. Where age and maturity, that says, you know, sometimes they can be too young. Sometimes if, if they're we, of course, we're talking about traumatized children. Of course, it's difficult to get their voices heard but it's not impossible. And you all know better than I, that children, we just find the way to talk to them. We don't all communicate in the same way. We all have different ways. So we need to shift this mindset that speaking to younger children is the exception, but actually that it's just the most joyful thing we do, even with children who have had a really difficult time. It's the most, it's the most rewarding thing that we do. So we must, we must be in a mindset of we will do, not let's find a way not to do. Um, uh, so, and, and even when children say, I don't wanna take part in this, they are saying something. They are saying something that we should hear and we should listen to. So what we have to do is understand that children are not passive recipients of services but as I've said actors in their own development and 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 by doing that we are we are in we have the knowledge that involving children does actually deliver better decisions for them which are more relevant and better informed now let me be clear how a ch giving a child a voice listening to children including them doesn't mean you do everything that they tell you to do they ask you to do because you have the responsibility of doing it in their best interest. But that's everything I say doesn't get done. Actually, I'm Children's Commission, I have that experience quite a lot. But what, what I need to hear is why, why is it not possible? And then I've, I feel respected, I feel heard, I feel listened to. And that will help that child um, uh, understand and be part of the decision-making process that they, that they understand what's happening around them. Um, also, going back to mindset, we need to remember that it can be very daunting for adults and, and as professionals, uh, because it makes us more accountable and responsive to, to, um, to, to our children and possibly dilutes power. And I suppose what I would say, if, dilu if the dilution of your power is a concern for you, I would ask you to look in the mirror and think about what job you're doing and why you're in this job. But I don't underestimate how daunting and scary it is to, to, to actually embed this way of working. As I said, children understand the decisions made about them, but, uh, uh, and children benefit from the very act of participation as it, it contributes to their skills, to the sense of their own power and role, to confidence enjoy and enjoyment, and actually engages them in the broader society and in the world around them. And it talks about how we move from this thing about in social work. And I, I'm, I suppose I am very much talking about a British Irish view in social work. We see children and families as clients or we used to. Um, and and it, we need to shift that move from clients to partners in this process. And that's what um, listening to all of them does. What the Panda Project 
aims to do is that working with under 12s support social workers to continue, as I said, that move from being viewed from clients to, um, or recipients of services to partners. And it brings to life the pedagogic, the pedagogical, pedagogical approach. Someone can ever say that word right. But it's so important if we are serious about being social pedagogues, then we have to be serious about working with our young people. So we, but we have to skill our social workers. They are under enormous pressure um, with, with huge caseloads that I've just already talked to you. We've seen increase in referrals. We've seen increase in, in children who are coming into care, enormous pressures. And, and I am not for one minute suggesting as individuals, they're not doing their best. The issue is that they need to be given the time and the space to develop the skills and build their confidence to be able to support those little voices, to be involved in those big decisions. And in order to facilitate the relationship, the, uh, the processes and places need to be right too. The work must continue to shift from trying to get our children to fit in to our planning, reviewing, education and transition development processes. We try to shoehorn children into these very adult centric processes. And what we have to do is flip it the other way around and adapt those processes to meet um, the needs of our, of our children, young people, particularly the under 12s and, and the younger ones. It's not about them fitting into the way we do business. It's about our business fitting into the, into the best way they can be involved. And that obviously includes child friendly spaces. Uh, and, and, and actually, I think we are beginning to do that. I was in, in Derry yesterday. It, it, it opening an, um, a facility and actually it was brilliant to see how they were determined to make it more child friendly. So as I've said there um, in the last 20 years there's been an increase in the recognition and acceptance of children's right to participate and have their voice heard um, in decision making processes and legislators, government departments, statutory agencies are increasingly acknowledging the CRC it, um, and the fact that when listened to, children and young people can play a vital role in the delivery and planning of services. But in the home of the Lundy model, we have in Northern Ireland, the most eminent theorists on children's participation, Professor Laura Lundy, who's, who's a colleague of Karen's. But, um, and so we should know better here in Northern Ireland where the Lundy model was developed. But progress here has been erratic and piecemeal. Um, and we can see that children under 12, particularly we've seen great work in schools and we can see that they have, they, they can have, they do have a voice. And like I said, we do need to listen. And that's why, I, as I say, Panda is important. And I can sense a shift. I can sense a shift in Northern Ireland. I can sense a, a sense a shift in the mindset. I can sense a shift in the voice. And also what social media has done is young people taking that, that platform and that voice and organizations like Voipec supporting young people who we consider more vulnerable to be able to find their voice in a safe and controlled way. So in conclusion, and you'll be pleased that I'm doing really well. I've, this is the first time in ages I've stuck to time, brilliant. So like Karen, actually it's quite interesting, Karen, I didn't realize we had so much in common. I trained as a social worker in the 1980s and came oh. to Northern Ireland in 1994. Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> Um, I, had, I left the statutory sector and worked in NGOs working with children and young people. But when I, I, I was a very young social worker, I, I went to university to study. And I must admit, I did have a little bit of a saviour complex. And for me, um, and, and a lot of us at that time, it was about helping, helping children and saving them. But thankfully, as I've said, that's changed. And we see children and families as partners in their care. And as such, to be genuine partners in the decisions made about that care, we have to listen to them, we have to respect them, and, and we have to understand that we can't do this without them. So we have to think differently about the power relationship and see children for the active citizens they are, because they never have failed in my however many years since I qualify, which is nearly coming, uh, well, 35 years since I qualify, I have never been let down when I've asked a child their opinion. Um, I've been surprised, I've been challenged, but I have never ever been disappointed. 
and it's it's it is the most rewarding and enriching and challenging and scary experience but that's what it's all about so thank you very much for listening um, really good luck with the work. It's so important that these that, that, that these little ones, the under 12, have a voice and are heard. And I really look forward to seeing those changes make a difference to the lives of children who are experienced social work in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kula. That that was great. We could have listened to you for a lot longer. You could have went over. <laughs> oh, right. But oh, there I was being disciplined. <laughs> But I'm sure there'll be some questions and comments for you in, in the next section. Um, we'll definitely be coming back to you. And for anyone who's maybe not familiar with the Lundy model, we will try to get a link um, to that mod model put in, in the chat during the break. So our next um, presentation is from Eilish McDaniel, who is the Director of Family and Children's Policy at the Department of Health. So she's going to set out the legislative and, and policy framework for children's participation. And just a little point to note, um, at the very start, for the first minute and 20 seconds, the sound is quite low. Um, so you might want to turn your volume up, but please be aware that the sound gets adjusted about a minute and a half into the presentation. So if you've turned it up very loud, you might get deafened <laughs> very quickly. So just be watchful of that. Okay, thank you. I'm Eilish McDaniel, Director of Family and Children's Policy in the Department of Health. I have policy responsibility for child protection, looked after children, adoption and family support. Thank you for the invitation to speak at today's Little Voices Big Decisions event. There are four areas that I want to cover um, by way of today's presentation. They include um, the legislative framework that we as policymakers work within or require others to work within and what it requires in terms of the engagement or involvement of children and young people in decision making by public authorities affecting their young lives. Some key policy documents, instruments and specifically how they reinforce what the legislation requires in terms of involvement of children and young people. Thirdly then, how we measure up against our own policies in terms of how we have involved children and young people in policy development within health and social care. And finally, what I consider to be the key challenges going forward. Turning to the first slide um, then. All of us work within um, the framework of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, a legally binding international agreement against which we are assessed periodically. And we're about to start the latest examination by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Article 12, um, which relates to the respect for the views of, of, the, of the child, is particularly relevant to what we're discussing today. However, Article 13, freedom of expression, Article 2, non-discrimination, and Article 3, the best interests of the child, are also clearly of relevance. The Children's Services Cooperation Act, brought forward in 2015, requires children's authorities, including government departments, to work together to improve the well-being of children and young people in Northern Ireland. It requires the adoption of a children and young people strategy by the, by the executive, and in doing so requires the executive, that's government departments, to consult children and young people, their parents and guardians and others representing their interests. Work is ongoing to establish effective participation mechanisms as part of implementation of the strategy. And while the process is being led by the Department of Education, the Department of Health is fully engaged in the process. The Children Order, the principal body of law governing the current protection of children in Northern Ireland, is founded on a number of key principles to safeguard children and promote their welfare. One of, key, sorry, one of eight key principles is that children should be kept informed about what happens to them and should participate when decisions about, are, are being made about their future. The Children Order not only guides social workers by creating statutory duties for them and affording them powers to act, it also guides the courts. The welfare checklist provided for at Article 3 of the Children Order requires a court to have regard for the ascertainable wishes and feelings of the child concerned, taking account of the child's age and understanding. And when a health and social care trust is considering making a child looked after or providing them with accommodation under Article 21 or 26, again they are required to ascertain the child's wishes and give them due consideration, again taking account of the child's age and understanding. 
The requirement to take account of a child's age and level of understanding recognises that it may not always be possible or practicable nor appropriate to seek the views or wishes of a child. Guardians ad litem, likewise appointed under Article 60 of the Children Order to represent the child's interests in court proceedings, are required to speak to and listen to children. It's important that children feel that they have been consulted, that their views have been properly considered and that they have participated as partners in the decision making process. However, it's equally important that children are not made to feel that the, that the burden of decision making falls to them, nor, nor should they be forced to attend meetings if they choose not to do so. Crucially, where a child has communication difficulties, appropriate specialist provision will need to be made available so that it's possible for the child to express his views. Other legislation which explicitly and requires the involvement of children and young people is the Safeguarding Board Act of 2011. The Act established the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland, a partnership task with working together to safeguard children and to promote their welfare. In the exercise of its statutory functions, the SBNI is required by the Act to promote communication between the SBNI and children. The Adoption and Children Bill, which the Health Minister is aiming to introduce in the Assembly before summer recess, makes a range of provisions to further safeguard the right of children and young people who are in care, have left care or are, are at risk of coming into care, to have a say in what happens to them, to be listened to and have their views taken into account where appropriate. The bill introduces a new welfare checklist, similar to that in the Children Order, but specifically tailored for adoption decisions which includes a requirement to ensure that the child's wishes and feelings, etc., are taken into account. The bill will amend the children order to strengthen the voice of the child in a number of ways. Trusts will be required to ascertain and consider a child's wishes and feelings before deciding what services, if any, to provide to children in need and when making certain decisions relating to child protection. The duty to take into account a child's wishes before providing them with accommodation under Article 21 will be expanded to require their feelings to be considered also. A wider range of children and young people will be able to benefit from advocacy services, which the Bill places on a statutory footing. A wider range of children and young people will have the right to raise issues or make representations, and that includes complaints about the social care services they receive. And finally, the Bill will introduce into the Children Order a range of corporate parenting principles which include a duty on trusts to encourage children and young people to express their views, wishes and feelings and to take those into account. Well, there are a number of policy documents which reinforce the requirement to engage children and young people in the course of health and social care policy development and or service design. So for example, the Department of Health launched a co-production guide for Northern Ireland connecting and realising value through people in August 2018 to support the application of a co-production approach across our health and social care system. Among other things, co-production, which we also refer to as co-design and co-creation, is about ensuring we work in partnership with users of health and social care services and place them at the centre of decision making to improve health and wellbeing outcomes, and that includes children and young people. Cooperating to safeguard children and young people, which we published in 2017, which is guidance for agencies working um, to keep children safe from harm, includes guidance on involving children in the process of protection. The guidance stipulates that practitioners should take full account of the rights of the child or young person and meaningfully engage them in decisions which contribute to meeting their needs, including their safeguarding needs. It requires that children and young people are made aware and help to understand what services are available and why they're being provided, how they can be involved and how they can be helped to articulate their views, wishes, feelings and their own sense of the risks um, to which they're exposed and what they feel can be done to keep them safe, how their views will be taken into account when decisions about services to be provided and their future are being made, what concerns professionals have about them, how safeguarding and child protection processes work and why and how decisions and um, which run contrary to the views uh, of children and young people have been made. The guidance also stipulates that children and young people who lack capacity to express their views on a particular matter should be provided with more specific or personalised support, for example, advocacy, representation or communication support, such as through interpreters for sign or other languages. Importantly, the guidance makes it clear that all children and young people should be informed that 
Ultimately, decisions will be taken to safeguard them and to promote their welfare. One more recent uh, development is the use of child right impact assessments conducted on new policy relating to children and young people. Through the assessment process, as policymakers were prompted to scrutinise the involvement of children and young people in the development of proposals, and that assists us to consider how best to ensure that the voices of children are heard from the earliest stage of policy development, to evidence that it's been done, and to demonstrate how the contributions of children and young people have influenced the design of policy. By way of the third slide, um, I'm trying to demonstrate whether we're following our own policy by engaging children and young people in the policy development process. And there are a few examples which I think demonstrate that we have and also that we're getting better at how we go about it. In establishing the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland and the development of an online safety strategy, we sought the views of parents, children, and included some of those involved in the child protection process. The online safety strategy recently published by the department, originally called an e-safety strategy, was renamed as a result of feedback received from children and young people. In consulting on a draft adoption and children bill, a young person's version of the consultation document was produced. On behalf of the department, um, Bernardo's facilitated the engagement of young people aged between 13 and 19 with a range of physical and learning disabilities, including autism and visual impairment. Boypick engaged care experienced young people aged 13 and over through a workshop involving departmental officials. Again, assisted by Boypick, care experienced young people participated in a process to identify alternative accommodation options for children in care. Departmental officials and health and social care professionals were part of the process alongside the children and young people. Care experienced children and young people were also integral to the development of a recently published looked after children's strategy, A Life Deserved, through a series of events including public events in each health and social care trust area and workshops facilitated by, Vo by VoIPIC and Fostering Network to capture the views of under 12s, adolescents and children um, with a disability. A questionnaire, play and survey work was also facilitated by VoIPIC to capture the views of children and young people, including at summer camps. And discussions were also supported by Include Youth to capture the views of older adolescents, care leavers and those in the Juvenile Justice Centre. Department of Health and Department of Education officials were represented at the majority of these events. Feedback was provided um, to children and young people on how their input was reflected in the draft strategy and they were provided with a further opportunity to input to the final version. The feedback session was facilitated by VoIPIC, held at a weekend and in an informal setting. Department of Health and Department of uh, Education officials also attended. Officials reported that the children and young people who had been involved in the earlier events demonstrated a real sense of ownership of the strategy. Teenage and under 12 versions of the strategy were also produced for consultation and final publication and we've made a commitment to ensure that children and young people will be integral to the implementation of the strategy. Another example includes the development of a new service model for separated or unaccompanied asylum seeking children and young people. The proposals currently being consulted on have been informed by um, children and young people who have arrived in Northern Ireland seeking asylum. Engagement was facilitated by VoIPIC and took the form of conversations held wherever and however the young people felt most comfortable, for example, where the young person lived or on a walk in a local park. In the establishment of a new regional joint care and justice campus, we've engaged children and young people with direct experience of the Lakewood Secure Care Centre and Woodlands Juvenile Justice Centre, with the assistance of a number of organisations represented on a reference group. The views of children and young people reflected in the consultation document published in October 2020. A child-friendly version of the consultation document and an animation explaining the campus proposals were also produced and used to engage children and young people in the consultation exercise. One final example includes a proposal to extend emergency COVID regulations, which um, provide a level of flexibility to health and social care trusts in the exercise of their statutory duties as it related to looked after children and care leavers. And as a consequence of engaging children and young people in the process, plans to extend the emergency regulations were shelved. There's a growing emphasis on co-design in health and social care, and that requires us to engage service users at a much earlier stage and give them the opportunity to shape policy proposals. This is a world away from consultation on well-developed policy proposals. 
This is something we need to get better at in terms of our engagement of children and young people in policy development. It's evident that we rely quite significantly on third sector organisations to support the engagement um, with children and young people. We need to reach the point where we have the confidence to work as equal partners with third sector organisations in our engagement with children and young people in the course of policy development, implementation and review. It's also important that we take broadly consistent approaches across all government departments and I think this will be facilitated through the implementation of the Children and Young People Strategy. To date, um, we have engaged with older children and teenagers in the main. The nature of a policy or service may at times make this necessary, and this is what the, is acknowledged in the legislation. We acknowledge that this is an area where we need to get better and look forward to the outcome of today's event. It will hopefully help us strengthen our current participation practice. My own area of policy relates to children and young people and families who are among the most vulnerable. Informed by children and young people, we must continue to find ways to engage them, which recognises their vulnerability but never patronises them and always minimises the risk of traumatising or re-traumatising. Thank you and I look forward to receiving the feedback from today's event. Okay, so Karen, are you there? I'm here. Oh, okay. Online. Um, okay, folks, so that brings the, those two presentations to an end. Um, I was just trying to check our schedule there, actually, <laughs> to check whether we were on time or out of time. Um, Alicia, have we got time for a couple of questions or should we move to a break? Um, well, it is 2.52, Karen, so we could take a couple of questions if yes. you've had any. Yes, that's great. Um, so what we'll do now um, is just open up for a couple of questions. We're, we are conscious of the time. Um, we do only have a two hour slot. So I think the most that we could do is probably take a couple of questions. So I'm not sure if anyone has a question that they would like to address. No, I'm not seeing any questions in my I'm not sure that's a good sign or a bad sign. <laughs> At the moment. Everything was explained so well, Kula. Yeah, yeah. No that's, Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> Kula, I, th I think one thing that um, is interesting just for all of those people who are listening in, and I don't know whether you have a comment on this, is kind of the amount of legislative and policy development in the area, because we heard a little bit from you about some of the key uh, legal frameworks and policy developments. And then obviously we've had Eilish as well, who has provided more detail on those. What, what as, as a children's commissioner, what's your own reflection on those and then their implementation in practice? Um, so it's hard to argue with any of them, but you hit the nail on the head, Karen, when you say about implementation in practice. Yeah. Sometimes we concentrate on developing strategies and action plan and then take a big sigh of relief and move on to the next thing um, instead of remembering that actually de developing the strategy writing the policy and the action plan is only, um, I've said this a lot, anyone who's heard me speak, is only 10, 15% of the work. Mm. The actual work is in implementing it, is in making it happen. And that's why we have a lot of good policies. We have a lot of good legislation. It's very hard to argue with anything in the, uh, in the new um, strategy for, for looked after children. The challenge is making it a reality in the lives of children, young people, having, making that difference. And that's what we're not good at. We're 
all talk mm. or right we're not all talk we are really good at the talk we need to get better at the action yeah I, it, there's that, no other way of, of there's no nice way you can't no. sugarcoat that and I think that's a I think that's an important observation because anyone listening in might be thinking wow you know there's a whole load of kind of legislative policy development it's top notch and it is obviously there's no question about that but there's always that gap between the frameworks that we have and then what we actually manage to do in practice which kind of reflects the whole emergence of, of, of this panda project really it, it really is about the implementation in practice and you know Teresa and I are going to be having a conversation about that after the break so I, th I think your observations Kula are really yeah. important but also that there are pockets or uh, more than pockets of excellent practice on the ground yes that go unseen and unheard and unheralded and then that again you know that is where a project like Panda. It, we're not we're not reinventing the wheel. It's not yeah. as big a mounting as we think we have to climb because there's some really good practice. It's about harnessing that and learning from that, and sharing it and scaling it up. And that's where you know, like I said, Panda comes in because there are some fabulous examples of hearing the voice of children yeah. on the ground. It's just how we make it the norm and yeah. and talk about it a bit better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not the exception, if you like, yeah. as, as you said earlier on. I, thank you so much. Um, I think what we'll do now, Alicia, is just break. Um, I'm just looking at the time here. So if we call people back at kind of five past five past three, depending on where you're phoning in from, or five past four if you're in Europe, <laughs> would that be okay? Um, so it's five past the hour. How about if I say that? <laughs> that might make it easier given the time zones that we're working across. Would that be okay? So you, you can take a, a break for eight minutes, stretch your legs and then come back and listen to some more. Thank you, Kula. Um, so next up, we have a presentation from Boypec, from Jenny and Nicola, who are, uh, if you can't see them, are on screen one, if I ask them to wave. So just notice we have some pop-up stands, and it's very hard to make out the real people <laughs> from the pop-up stands in the background. Um, but Jenny and Nicola are going to give you a little bit of information about our organisation, um, and also talk through some practical examples of resources or tools that they have adapted um, in their work with younger children. So over to you girls. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny and it's lovely to be here today. Um, welcome and we just want to let you know a little bit about VoIPIC before we begin. Um, VoIPIC, Voice of Young People in Care, is a charity for children and young people with a lived experience of care in Northern Ireland. We were set up in 1993 by a group of young people in care and professionals. And it's our job to promote the rights and voice of children in care and caregivers. And we want every child in care to have a safe, stable and positive experience of care and to be involved in the decisions about their own lives. We listen, we learn and together we make changes. So what do we do? Um, our advocacy service um, provide specially trained advocates to support children and young people by listening to them and informing them on their rights about being in and moving on from care. Advocates um, make sure that these young people's voices are heard in care and pathway planning and all the decision making processes. Our participation service helps young people to connect with other young people who have a lived experience of care through group work, participation forums or activity days for all ages that build their confidence and personal development skills. And then influence, influence and change is about believing that young people are the experts and it's important that their voices are heard by decision makers. So 
why pick work alongside other organisations, including the government, to make sure that that happens. So the key messages today that we would like to share with you about working with under 12s are trust, relationship and intent. And we know that children who have experienced trauma are very often mistrusting of adults and very guarded about what they share. And this is why we feel est establishing trust is so important with that age group. For us, this is the basis of moving forward with any meaningful work. To build trust, we have to be consistent, creative, create stability and predictability, and go at that child's pace. We need to hold the space for that child and create an environment that feels safe for them. And when it comes to building relationships, as we've mentioned, many children with traumatic backgrounds are hypervigilant, so they are super attuned to body language, tone, and so it's our job to be very mindful of the words that we use and the movements that we use when we're with them to provide reassurance to those children. The initial sessions for us with under 12s are all about building trust and relationship. So getting down on the ground, eye contact, active listening, non-verbals, interaction, playing together. And after a session with an under 12, we are drained because there are so many skills at play. Um, you are listening, you're paraphrasing, you're not taking notes, so you're trying to retain all their information. You're observing, you're exchanging nods, non-verbals, um, and you're playing and you're having fun together. And finally, we feel that intent is another really crucial aspect of working with children under 12. In our roles as advocates, we must make it clear that we're independent and we're solely there to help those children express their wishes and views and feelings. And it's our job to share that with others. The child is aware of the intent and the purpose and there's no confusion. It's important that children are, are aware of the boundaries of your role. And when I was preparing for this um, and reflecting on my own work with children under 12s, the image of the arcade claw came to mind. And it's a good visual of work with children under 12s because in that game, you don't always get what you're aiming for straight away. It takes time, and patience, energy, and sifting through all the other things before you get to your prize. And with under 12s, I feel that you have hours worth of conversations about unicorns, TV shows, wobbly teeth, favourite dinners, school fallouts, and all of that is really important, especially when you can bring it back up to the child the next time. But eventually, you will be able to get to the prize. You will hear in the midst of all that chatter, some really, really powerful and insightful and meaningful perspectives coming through, the children's wishes and feelings. And it mightn't always be through words. It might come through a picture or a puppet or a song. So as Jenny has said, um, the foundation of our work with under 12s is trust, relationship and intent. Um, but we also use a number of tools and resources and creative approaches as well. Um, so one of these tools is the Outcome Star, which you can see on the screen. Um, so we complete this with, with all young people coming into VoIPIC. And this tool works well with under 12s. And um, it also covers the key areas of their review meeting as well. You can see their physical health, uh, where they are living, their feelings and their behaviours, um, their social and emotional, um, their self-confidence. Um, and you can see that it works really well for our, for our younger children. It encourages young people to explore different areas of their life and it also introduces them to scaling as well. So you can see there they, they go from one um, to five. And we sometimes complement this as well with more creative tools. Um, so for this um, 10 year old child, um, we did it as a, as a starting session and um, we looked at a, at a hoodie um, and they were able to sign it with, with the things that were really important to them. So um, things around um, computer games, TikTok, social media um, and also other things as well, people who were important to them. 
um, and this gave us an insight into to who they are and to their um, to, to their feelings. Um, we also explored with them um, their family and friends and their um, their their super strengths, and this gave us an insight into them and um, their family relationships and also their friend relationships. But it also gave me um, a way to 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 look and explore their own strengths as well. Some children find it much easier to look at other people's strengths before they look at their own. So you can see then we moved on to looking at the, at the child's superhero strengths as well, which gave us a great insight into their um, into exploring their confidence and their self-esteem and, and their feelings and how they felt about their self. Um, another tool that we find really useful is a relationship circle and it can be done in lots of different ways. Um, and it's used to help children explore um, the key people in their lives and the roles that they play. Um, so an example of that was, um, was what I did with a, with a young boy who really was struggling articulating his feelings. Um, we had been asked to explore with him how he was feeling about spending time with some previous foster carers. Um, so I used this picture of the old Trafford ground um, and had it on a, on a big, big page for him. Um, he was a big football fan and a big Manchester United fan um, and encouraged him to use the whole space of the football pitch. Um, so the young person spent time thinking about every position and who in his life filled it, such as centre forward, defence, who was in the stands, who was in the coaching area. Um, and it really was amazing actually to watch um, as this young person who struggled with his feelings articulated everybody's key roles in his life with real joy and passion and was able to say exactly who they were and, and where they were in his life and the important roles that they had, which otherwise we, we wouldn't have been able to get because we used something that, um, that, that really played to his strengths and that he enjoyed. And um, so this resource can be and can be adapted um, and changed in ways that, that suit the young person. So this is a really simple version of it um, that we can use as well, where the child goes in the middle and again, they put their key people in the next circles. Um, another example is, is a Lego version, and this can be done in, in real life as well um, and used with actual Lego boards and people and just giving the, the children a real opportunity to to, to, to think about their important people and be able to do it in a, in a creative way, in a way that they, they can relate to. So another example of, of work with a young person is, um, again, another young person who was really struggling with their emotions and their feelings and had very little awareness of, of basic emotions, even of, of feeling sad or happy and unable to see if, if other people were feeling that way too. So I was exploring with him his feelings on moving school. Um, I printed off a variety of monsters with different faces and different emotions and tried to avoid those, um, those basic emotions of happy faces and sad faces um, to get away from, from that that he, that, that he quite often avoided. Um, as you can see, the young person picked out um, some of the faces and, and as, as we picked them out, um, I wrote down some of his feelings such as not knowing anyone at a new school. Um, he was happy about maybe getting to play football at lunchtime at school. Um, he wanted to pick his own school, like he felt other children did. And he wanted to be able to move around a school building um, like others did. So these were really important things for him and really important information that we were able then to, um, to pass on. Um, so I'm still working with this young person um, and recently um, I met up with him to explore his wishes and feelings before his review meeting. Um, so he has recently moved out of a long-term foster care home um, and I wanted to explore with him his feelings on what he wanted now. Um, we started by, by playing football because he, he still struggles with, with his emotions and being able to articulate how he's feeling. Um, we started off in a distance away, um, quite far apart, he kicked the ball um, between each other. Um, and as he became more confident um, with the subject and more confident about, about sharing his feelings, we moved closer together and we started to kick the ball against a wall back and forward to each other. Um, and this gave him the opportunity to avoid eye contact with me, to take the pressure off the big conversation, and also to allow him to release any frustration and anger that he was feeling as we talked. 
This allowed me to explore these really big and sensitive topics in a way where he felt comfortable. Um, and he also allowed us to focus on this conversation for much longer than we ever would have done if we were sitting at a table or we were looking at each other. And um, so just another example of, of how we got that really important information and how he was really feeling about big areas of his life. And we're able then to pass that on in his, in his review meeting. So just to finish, um, we spoke to, to some of our experts um, at FOIPIC and we asked them um, what they felt about the grown-ups who worked with them and if they had any important advice for them. Um, so those experts were aged from 9 to 11 and they had some, um, some really important advice for all the grown-ups out there. Um, so they said that you should be nice, you should be kind and you should be helpful. Um, they also said, please respect me even if I am a lot younger than you. And they said to re remember to really listen to me, no matter what the cost. And I suppose that really um, stands out to us that, that young people know, you know um, whether they're being listened to or whether it's just a service. And um, so the young people are asking to be listened to no matter the cost. And that could be the cost of your time and um, where you might need to spend a little bit longer, as Jenny said, to listen about wobbly teeth and unicorns or maybe the cost of a, of a milkshake or something else. And they also said, sometimes I don't want to talk when you visit. And maybe it's just because I want to go out and play or catch up on my homework. So the children explained to us that sometimes they have lots of professionals calling and sometimes all they want to do is just be like a child and just do their homework so they can go and play later on or go and catch up with their friends and not to be offended by that. And they said, treat children the same way that you want to be treated as adults. And um, so there was a big theme for these children about respect and being wanted to be treated as equal and as the same way as you want you were wanted to be treated yourself. Um, and they said, again, respect everyone, me, my family and the people who matter to me. So again, treating them as you want to be treated, but also remembering about those really important people in their lives as well, their family and they're really important people. And lastly, they said, it's good to be funny. So they said that they, they want people to be funny, to have fun, to be relaxed, and um, when you come and engage with them. So we really appreciate your, your time and thank you very much for, for listening to our presentation. Thank you, Jenny and Nicola, and that's some great advice there from the experts. And so on to our final presentation of the day and hopefully we'll have some short time afterwards for any questions or comments. But next up we're going to hear from Mary Louise Sloan and as a social work leader her and her team designed a framework especially for engaging directly with children and young people. So we're just going to see a short video. Hello, my name is Mary Louise Sloan and I am currently the Head of Service for Specialist Residential Care in the South Eastern Trust. Today I would like to take an opportunity to provide an overview of the development of the Story Framework, which is a child-centred assessment framework for engaging children and young people in areas that matter most to them during professional involvement. I would like to start with explaining the background to the development of the Story Framework. Between 2015 and 2019, I was a principal social worker based in the Newcastle Child and Family Team. Our service, like most field social work teams, work with children up to the age of 18. Our involvement ranged from a family support role through to child protection and looked after care experienced young people. Similar to many teams, our challenges centred on high caseloads and subsequent paperwork involved with these. Staff turnover and retention was a significant difficulty due to our rural location with limited access to voluntary and community services. During exit interviews, staff reported job dissatisfaction in not having enough time to work with children and young people. This was also linked to a common theme identified from case management reviews in relation to the voice of the child being unclear during assessment and involvement with social work teams and areas like family trees and chronologies not always being visible in files despite staff reporting that they had covered these areas during their involvement. Another area I was mindful of was whilst it was positive in Northern Ireland that we have a common assessment framework called the Unicini, staff report that it is not a child-friendly document and wouldn't be something that you would want to present to a young child as a focus of your discussion. 
Whilst we have committed staff wanting to deliver high quality, child-centred services, our mandatory paperwork doesn't promote or guide staff in the regard. And as the saying goes, if it's not in the file, it didn't happen. From a child and family perspective, our challenges were inevitably impacting on the quality of service that we provided to our children and families. A common area of concern is the child and family's anxiety around the social work role. And in the absence of a child-friendly framework, it was felt that guidance around common areas that should be covered with young people would be helpful to structure our involvement. Family feedback identified a feeling that case conference reports and looked after children reports often focus on what a parent is or is not doing rather than the well-being of the child. And as a manager, I was finding an increase in young adults requesting their social work files. And I had great difficulty in trying to go through large amounts of redacted files to help young adults and parents later in their life to explain what was going on for them during their childhood years from a social work perspective. In considering new ways, I took cognizance of the research around the need to reclaim relationship-based practice and enabling workers to build on their desire and develop their techniques in engaging with children and families, which would hopefully promote and provide better outcomes for the social work, child and family relationship. In 2017, I had a fantastic opportunity to complete a quality improvement fellowship and I was challenged to identify a project that was a strategic priority across children's services. I attended the BMJ Quality Safety Forum in London. I was inspired by a keynote speaker, Margaret Murphy, whose son had died through medical error. She reflected in her preparation for a presentation that she hoped she would be able to tell her son's story and experience the way he would want it to be told. This highlighted the importance of building something that enables us as workers to help families at a later stage to understand their experiences. When considering the concept of promoting a buy-in and ownership approach with my team, this project needed to be an area of interest for the whole team. And collectively, we agreed to develop the story framework and apply a quality improvement methodology to its development. Looking at our overall aim for this project, it was to 80% of all children aged between five to 17 year olds that engage with the Newcastle Child and Family Team will have a child-centered assessment and plan by February, 2018. Firstly, we completed a baseline to evidence the need for an improvement. And based on 52 children known to our team, 82% of the children reported they were unaware that they had a plan in place to support them. The same percentage reported being unclear of the role and not feeling listened to or involved. This was echoed by senior social workers and principal social workers right across the service who reported that children's views and goals were often unclear in their assessment. Children's comments included they thought the social worker called to see their parents, they were unclear why the social worker visited, their experience of turnover of social workers, and that visits often concentrated on how have you been since the last visited, how's school, etc., and largely determined by the social worker. When considering the factors that impacted on our social workers' ability to form child-centred plans, there was a collective agreement across the team that a lack of child-friendly assessment framework was the biggest contributory factor. This formed the basis for our improvement focus. Our project team had representation from social work, health, voluntary sector, children and parental representation. In considering our framework, we looked at learning from our colleagues in Scotland by focusing on a person-centred approach. Initially, we took a person-centred planning tool and held focus groups with young people who designed the areas that they felt mattered most to them and would be happy to discuss with their social workers. Our first draft was designed by our young people and staff. Through testing, we identified further development and a final draft was developed. It was important to ensure that we supported the regional strategic priority in relation to the three houses exercise that is used as part of the signs of safety approach. It was agreed that this not only complements that, but enhances this approach by going further to address other key areas that had previously been identified as needing a focus. With 65% of the population being visual learners, we were really challenged to create a child-friendly, colourful and visual framework that was simple and easy to understand. Through collaboration, it was also agreed that this framework should be presented on one page. An interactive page tiger was developed in partnership with our learning improvement team to bring the framework to life and enables workers to allow children to flick through each area and a child-friendly explanation was provided by our young people. 
The page tagger is easily accessible from a hyperlink and the toolbar down the left hand side enables workers, children and families to understand the background and process. The full document is available to click on at the bottom of the toolbar. The main page also has pop-up explanations of what each of the nine domains on the framework focus on. The language used to explain each of the domains has been developed by children and young people and includes Family tree Each story where possible should start with the child's family tree, thus enabling workers to explore a genogram, echo map to determine family members and other key relationships for the child. Good things, likes and hobbies Likes and hobbies enable workers to explore interests, strengths and good things in the child's life. My school. My school allows workers to discuss school life with the child, subjects, peers, teachers and general feelings and views around school matters. The wishing well. This concept encourages exploration of hopes and dreams the child may have and allows for discussion about why these are important to the child and how these could be achieved. The worry wall. This explores areas a child may be worried about. Worries can be added onto the worry wall and it enables the practitioners to identify goals to address these worries. The safety house. This considers risks a child may have or be experiencing and promotes the use of a safety plan which is age appropriate and relevant to each particular child. My journey. This underpins the work and identifies key significant events in a child's life. Parents and carers can provide photos which capture the journey and workers can facilitate discussion around the meaning of significant events to the child. Support agencies can provide advice and support when exploring these issues with the child or young person or parent. The parking space. This is an area where an issue or a question that is important to the child can be parked to enable workers to clarify further information on the area the child has acquired about. An issue such as domestic violence may also prove to be too painful an issue to explore with the child at that time and can be revisited when the child or young person is ready and a greater therapeutic alliance is established with the worker. My space. This is an additional area for free narrative, thoughts that are, are not covered within the domains of the framework. It is important to acknowledge all contributions the child has made and my space captures these additional thoughts. We recognise that each child's preferred communication style is different. Some like apps, worksheets, board games, drawing, and this recognises that by providing autonomy to workers, but also ensuring consistent themes are covered. Alongside this, we have an electronic folder with a worksheet of each of the areas and small measurement tool, which enable children and workers to consider how important, worried, safe they feel about the areas they are discussing. It also enables workers to tune into the preferred method of communication, such as writing, drawing or uploading pictures of the content to the worksheet. There is also room for the workers analysis of the sessions and what they felt was significant for the child during that session. A person centred training programme was also developed to empower and enable staff to implement the proposed framework. In addition to developing the framework, we work with an adolescent group to develop a version for older children and a one page profile was created. Again, this is very self-explanatory and easy to access. It was always important from the outset to be able to bring an outcomes approach to this project and one way of capturing our qualitative and quantitative feedback from our children and young people. A co-designed feedback form was developed and the use of emojis was a preference for the children. Following implementation over the preceding months, we reviewed children's experiences and identified an improvement. We increased children's views of feeling listened to and involved from 18% to 94%, with the same improvement in children reporting their awareness of the safety network. A balancing measure that we were initially concerned about was the staff may feel that this would impact on their time. However, on evaluating their feedback, it was identified that this was not the case. And in fact, they reported they focused their time with a better quality discussion with their children and young people. Their experience was that children engaged freely and collectively as a team, they were able to compare and contrast various tools and methods of engagement under each of the areas. 46 of the 52 children were observed to positively engage with the framework. Three did not, and three were observed to just generally go through the motions rather than meaningful engagement. 
we used an outcomes-based accountability framework to present our outcomes and were able to present to senior and executive management teams across the Trust alongside the Regional Steering Group for Signs of Safety as a method of evidencing our outcomes. We've had really positive feedback from Professor Eileen Munro and have met with her to discuss this, our methodology, our development and our outcomes. She has subsequently shared it with the HSE um, nationally. My hope for the story framework would be that this could be used as a regional framework for both voluntary and statutory agencies to engage and work with children and young people. It would be fantastic to see a framework that has been co-produced by children and practitioners applied to complement our existing regionally agreed frameworks. Finally, how fantastic would it be to consider our future reporting, not only focusing on how many children we have involved in our services, but how many of these children feel listened to and involved in their assessment and plans. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, I just feel like the afternoon's been absolutely packed with brilliant ideas <laughs> all the way from start to finish. Um, I was due to uh, pull together a few reflecting thoughts, but I've actually um, handed that task over to Professor Gillian Roosh, who is part of our PANDA project. Uh, she's the expert that we have brought in to guide and advise us on the work that we're doing. Um, so I hope she's with us and she's able to share her concluding reflections. And then we, I realise by then we'll be slightly over time, but if, if there are questions that people have, then perhaps we could hang on for 10 minutes at the end. So we'll finish at 10 past four roughly rather than four. So uh, Gillian, if you're there, um we I'm here, Karen. love you to share your reflections with us thank you so much that's okay thank you um let me try and share my screen if i can um and um those of you that were with us in norway will will recognize this i was asked to do a similar task in norway can you see this um yeah lovely um and I was doing it more as the session was going on in Norway, whereas here um, I've sort of come in on this task slightly later, but I thought it was useful to try and use the same image really, because I've been at all four of the events now and the common themes that are coming through are very um, powerful and also some of the differences across the different um, European contexts. And what I've used here is a model that we developed in the work that Karen and I were involved in, um, called the Talking and Listening to Children project, where we devised this idea of an ecological model of communication, thinking about the child, their um, personal and family circumstances, which would be the yellow circle, and the wider context in which they are um, located, the social and political context. And here I'm just thinking of it as a way of thinking about what we've been hearing about through the Panda project in relation to what we might think about as ecological participation. And this real um, emphasis of the Panda project to move from rhetoric to reality. What does this really mean for us? And I think we've heard a lot of what it really means on the ground um, this afternoon in Northern Ireland. Um, and if we just start up in the top right here in relation to policy, and um, I'm going to say people's names incorrectly, I'm sure, so I apologise. I'll do my best. Is it Kula and Elish? Um, lovely um, Irish names, um, or maybe not all Irish, I'm not quite sure, but anyway. Um, this issue of the Northern Irish, Irish context and reference to the Troubles, and I was struck here by, um, you know, the issue of the wider political context in which um, people are working with children, even if those children maybe weren't born during the period which was called the Troubles. The, the, the collective trauma within the national context can't be ignored because it's within the history of these children's families. 
Um, and so I was drawing parallels in my mind when we were in Spain, in Madrid, um, thinking about the, um, the impact of the dictatorship in Spain and how this wider context has to be part of our thinking, even if it's not at the fore of our, our thinking when we're actually engaged in the room with the child. But it, it can't be ignored because it's part of the cultural, the political, the social context. But also I put the phrase in here, lines of sight. And this is a term that's been used by um, a senior social care inspector in the English context. But she talked about having lines of sight, that we must have lines of sight on a child, which maybe is an unfortunate image because it might have sort of military connotations. So, I mean, it may not be the right phrase at all, but what she was meaning was that people at the very top of the organization, so people in roles like children's commissioners or senior managers and directors of um, children's services need to know the children that they are the corporate parent for. And that then will have bearing on how the practitioners who are engaging directly with the children take up their task because this idea of relationship will be throughout the whole organization and within the sort of um, organizational psyche of working with children. So I think we must always be thinking at the, the macro level as well as right down at the micro level. The second um, box here I've, I've referred to as sort of practice and procedures and we heard some beautiful examples of things being adapted to work with children. And I was thinking about, you know, the, the senses, how we use our senses. Um, and the ones that came to the fore for me this afternoon were the, just simply seeing the child, being with the child. The difference between perhaps hearing and listening, um, we might um, put an emphasis on the fact that we listen, but do we hear them? Are we hearing what's being said? And how are we hearing it? Are we just hearing it through the words? Or are there other ways in which children are communicating to us? So needing to be alert to all that non-verbal communication that was referenced in one of the more practice focused presentations. And I loved this reference um, to touching the child in the child protection conference who um, our colleague sat next to her so that she could offer that really, just those simple small um, indications of awareness of what children need. So it's seeing, hearing, listening and touching at all levels, not just when you're directly in practice, but if you're in a management role, chairing any forum where a child might be present. So of course that gets us thinking about head, heart and hands, something passionate I know, uh, close to Karen's heart, something she's passionate about, which we've written about, the influence of social pedagogy on our social work practice. And I made a reference here to something called Me and My World as I was hearing that last presentation. This is work that's been done by a colleague in Brighton um, in England around developing children's um, recording for children, looked after children in a way that is child centred. And I felt a lot of the work that we were hearing about that had strong resonances with how do we make things child centred. And as we heard, and we heard in Belgium too, co-created, lovely examples in Belgium and here of, of resources being co-created with children. So if it's an app that they need, then it's an app we need to be developing. We have to respond to where the children are. But also within the practice and procedures square here, social workers can only listen to the extent that they are listened to. Um, and that's something that maybe didn't necessarily come out of this presentation, but it's something that I hold on strongly to because we're always tasking ourselves of how we can do our job better. Um, but in order to do our job, we need to be listened to. We need to have those spaces where we can process and digest the difficult information that we might be exposed to that is the child's lived experience. And then over in the left hand side, the person, the child at the centre of the ecological model, the uniqueness of the child, which I, I love those examples of football, Lego, superheroes. I've added unicorns in here. I just wondered if anybody noticed if there were any unicorns, but um, I put the unicorns in to see if you're still awake with us. Um, but just adapting standardised ways of doing things, of which there are a lot, but making them personal to the child. You know, you can't underestimate how a child will respond to that and feel uh, recognised. 
So finally, I mean, the three challenges that I've just put down here, and I'm sure there are many more. Um, Inga Sophie, one of our colleagues in Norway on the Panda Project, put in the chat. Um, she totally agreed with this idea of thinking of children as partners, partners and, particip and participants in this process. But what does it mean to move from a position of a child being um, a partner as opposed to a client? How will we know that? And then from activity to process, what I'm thinking about here is we have lots of wonderful examples here of creative ways of engaging with children. And we've heard them across all four of our presentations over the past few weeks. But how also are we addressing the skills and the um, understanding about what the child does with the activity? So it's not just the content of what they do, but how they do it and how are we developing our skill set as practitioners so that we can be alert to the process as well as the content of the sessions. And that then leads us to think about, we have to start in our head and think about what does a child need and how can we engage with them? We need to move to our hearts in order to engage with the child and allow ourselves to be open to their experiences and their emotions. And we need to take that knowledge then back to our heads in order to be able to inform the decision-making process on behalf of the child. And there was an important contribution, I think, in the chat about children must be involved in the decision-making process. They must be active participants, but they must also understand it is not their sole responsibility to decide what happens in their lives. Adults need to play their part in making decisions, but children's voices must be part of that decision-making process. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Gillian. There's uh, all sorts of really important reflections there uh, at the different levels in which we're working. And I just want to thank you so much for really pulling that all together really well um, from the whole kind of two hour session that we've been in. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that it is now um, past our allotted time, but I didn't want just to cut people off. So if anybody does have a question, uh, now is the time to ask it. Um, obviously, we, we perhaps need to limit the time for that. So I'm suggesting if you do have questions that we will definitely be finished uh, by 20 past the hour. Um, so I'll just open up the floor. And if not, that's fine too. <laughs> but just to provide you with the opportunity, if you do have anything that you would like to ask. Is there anyone, Lee? I don't know if I'm seeing. No, but there is maybe a nice uh, comment there just reminding us um, in the chat, just someone saying it's important that we don't forget the importance of the three senses, particularly touch and human connection in the world of Zoom meetings that we're in at the minute. Yes. How, how true is that? OK, um, it looks like we haven't got any um, questions. Um, so in that case, I'll hand back to Alicia just to finish off. Um, our learning event today. Thanks Karen um, and I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone for coming along and uh, attending our, our seminar. I hope everyone had a, one at least one message that they can walk away with uh, and use and put into practice today and I want to say a huge thank you to all of our presenters. It's not easy um, coming online and doing an event like this so a huge thank you to uh, Kula Yusuma, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, to Eilish McDaniel from the Family and Children's Policy Directorate, to Teresa um, for her conversations about the realities of practice, to Jenny and Nicola from Boypec, um, and to Mary Louise uh, for all of your contributions. Uh, we couldn't have done the event without you. And, um, and also thank you to Karen for also helping to facilitate those sessions. And a huge thank you to Lee, who has been working away there in the background and making sure that all of our technology uh, has been running smoothly. So um, and I really want to say this is our first opportunity really to share with you uh, information about the Panda Project. 
this is only really the start of our journey. So for anyone who is interested in keeping in touch, please let us know. We would like to keep you up to date. We have a regular newsletter that we can send out. Um, but particularly if you want to share and highlight any resources or processes that you think all of the partners in the Panda project should know about, because really what we want to do is to um, really spread, spread the, the good practice and the good news. We really want you to stay in touch with our project. So thank you very much for coming and thank you so much for hanging on, even though we did run over time, really do appreciate it. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>